Hey, it's Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy, and this week's Chalk Talk is a 12 lead that I think you'll find interesting because it's a finding that you don't see very often, but let's take a look and see. We don't have a rhythm strip here, but if you glance across at the cardiogram, it seems that the QRSs are really quite regular, and each and every one appears to have a P wave in front of it. If we measure the rate, we find this QRS lands on a heavy line, and it's 300, 150, 175, so it's going to wind up being about 80 80 beats per minute. And we can zoom in a little bit to take a look at lead two. And if we measure the PR interval, it starts just to the left of this heavy line and it ends just to the left of this heavy line. If you take a pair of calipers and you shrink them down, I think you'll find that the PR interval is just about 200 milliseconds, maybe a little shorter than that. We'll call it 190, but that's sort of splitting hairs. At least it's not longer than 200 milliseconds. The QRS looks quite narrow. It seems to only be about two small boxes wide. And so I think it's fair to call this just a normal sinus rhythm at 80 beats per minute with a PR of, you know, 190 to 200. So it's still in the normal range. The QRS will call 80 milliseconds. And if we measure the QT interval, it seems like the T wave probably ends around here someplace. And remember that if it goes past the midline between two QRS complexes, it's likely abnormal. In this case, it's not quite two large boxes. So we'll call the QT interval 360 and the R to R interval we can measure at 720. And if we use Bazet's formula to correct the QT interval, remember that the QTC is the QT divided by the square root of the R to R in seconds. So that would be 360 divided by 0.72, but you take the square root of that. So 72 square root, and then the equal sign gives you 424 milliseconds, which is a perfectly normal corrected QT interval. All right, let's back out a little bit because there's something I want to show you. And this is something that every single ECG technician should be aware of. Because when you first look at this cardiogram, notice lead one, the QRS is negative. That's very unusual for the QRS to be negative. And it could mean that you have incorrectly applied your limb electrodes. So remember that lead one goes in this direction and it measures the right arm to the left arm. But if you switch these two electrodes accidentally and you put the left arm electrode on the right side and vice versa, then lead one will actually record everything in the opposite direction. And so in a normal lead one, we expect an upright P wave. Why? Well, because the sinus node is in the high right atrium and the sinus signal goes down and to the left. So it's heading towards lead one. So we expect an upright P wave and also an upright QRS complex and an upright T wave if the axis is normal. This is what you would expect but if you reverse your limb electrodes, if your left arm and right arm are switched, what do you get? You get a negative P wave, you get a negative QRS complex, and then the T wave is usually inverted. So when you're obtaining an ECG, you absolutely have to look at lead one first. And if you see a negative QRS complex like this, you have to wonder if your electrodes are incorrectly applied. Get it? But in this case, the P wave seems to be upright and the T wave seems to be upright as well. So it's not reversal of electrodes here. And so what is it? Well, it means that the ventricular vector, the QRS axis, is headed away from lead one. Get it? So it's headed in this direction. There's some kind of abnormal QRS axis. All right, so let's figure out what the axis is. If I get rid of all this, what is the axis? Well, you have to figure out which lead limb is most isoelectric. It's really AVR that's equal sized above and below the baseline. It's certainly the closest one. So if AVR is most isoelectric, that's a serious problem because AVR is headed in this direction. And if it's most isoelectric, if it's equal sized above and below the baseline, that means the axis is perpendicular to that angle, which means it's either minus 60 or it's plus 120. And those are both abnormal, minus 60 being a marked left axis deviation and plus 120 being a marked right axis deviation. If you just look at lead one and you see that it's negative, you know that it's going away from lead one. So it's not going to be minus 60 because that would be headed in this direction. It's going away from lead one, so the axis has to be plus 120. When you see AVR is isoelectric or positive, you have to think in terms of hemi blocks. 
Now left anterior hemiblock gives us a marked left axis deviation and left posterior hemiblock gives us a marked right axis deviation, as long as you're not dealing with an infarction. So if you see an axis of plus 120, what you wanna do is make sure you don't have a lateral myocardial infarction. And the reason you do that is because if the lateral wall of the left ventricle is infarcted, if it's dead, then the signal is going to actually travel more rightward because you've got no myocardium that's living to pull the electrical signal in that direction. So an old lateral MI will cause a right axis deviation. And so what you want to do is look at the lateral leads and make sure you don't have a Q wave. So lead one and AVL are lateral leads and looking for Q waves, we actually don't see one. We actually see an R wave in one and AVL. And so you've now proven that this is not an old lateral MI. It has to be a left posterior hemiblock. You get it now what the textbooks tell you is left posterior hemiblock, you get a little R and a deep S wave in lead one. Well, that's exactly what we have here, a little R and a deep S. But I'm just showing you why you get a little R and a deep S. You get a deep S because the axis is going a little away from lead one, so it's gonna be mostly negative. And you have a little R wave because you do not have an old lateral MI. Okay, so we've established that there is a left posterior hemiblock, and the reason I make a big deal about it is that isolated posterior hemiblock is actually unusual. It doesn't happen very often. It's the least likely hemifascicle to be affected because it's actually the largest, and it tends to be the most robust. Anterior hemiblocks are much more common because it's a skinny little thing that can be affected by a number of things that slows it down and causes the anterior hemiblock appearance of a marked left axis deviation. Let's one more time get rid of all this and just look at the precordial leads real quickly. We can see the R wave progression is okay. You know, V4 is the point where the R wave grows taller than the S wave. So that's a pretty normal transition point. And the T waves do look upright. Although this looks a little biphasic, it looks a little funky. So some people would call non-specific T wave abnormalities, but that's a very soft finding. So to put everything else back, it's fair to say that this is simply a normal normal sinus rhythm with a left posterior hemiblock, plus or minus nonspecific T wave abnormalities. A lot of cardiologists would just ignore one isolated lead being a little funny looking. And that's it. So keep in mind that when you see a negative QRS complex in lead one, you should always check your leads first to make sure that you haven't accidentally reversed the right arm and the left arm. But otherwise, this posterior hemiblock finding is something you won't see very often. So make sure you know how to recognize it. And until next time, this is Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy. Thanks for watching.